We wouldn't sit with a cell phone that doesn't ring. You know, we call our cell phone company. There are things we would do in any other situation, but for some reason with families, it's like, uh, that's the way it is. This person just hangs mm -hmm. up on people. And it's like, they don't have to hang up on people. And I find that <laughs> in families, there is this collective thought about a person's behavior. Like it'll be a problematic mm -hmm. person and everybody thinks like, oh my gosh, this person they are whatever and nobody tells them it's like you know what we'll just all pretend when they're around that they're not a problem and then as soon as they leave we will come together and talk about how much of a problem that person is <laughs> and that'll really get us going and then it'll yeah. happen again well hello there and welcome to a very special episode of the terry cole show i am sharing with you a fascinating interview with um, a therapist named Nedra Tawab. So she's a New York Times bestselling author. She's a relationship expert. Um, she is. She um, wrote the book um, about having better boundaries and creating peace. She's been a therapist for 15 years. Her new book, though, is so fascinating. It's called Drama Free, A Guide to Managing Unhealthy Family Relationships. And it's sort of a natural follow-up from her book on boundaries and basically saying, you know, disordered boundaries, a lot of it has to do with dysfunctional family systems. So we talk all about having dysfunctional families and what you can do and what does it look like and what happens if you are the cycle breaker in your family system. We talk about codependency and we talk about enmeshment. So I hope that you love this interview with Nedra Toab as much as I loved interviewing her. I am super psyched to welcome Nedra Toab to the Terry Cole Show. Hi, Nedra. Welcome. Hello. How are you? Super excited about this conversation because you and I have been on parallel journeys when it comes to boundaries, and I can't wait to talk about your new book. I can't wait to talk about your other book because really the work that you're doing in the world right now I know you know this from the way people are responding to both of your books, yeah. but it is so crucial, the trying to understand. So we're going to talk about Drama Free, A Guide to Managing Unhealthy Family Relationships, because literally there's not one person listening or watching who would be like, oh no, I don't have any unhealthy family relationships. Right. So we know this book is for everyone, but I want to start with what inspired you? I mean, you've been a therapist for probably 12, 13 years now. Uh, 15, 15 years. Oh my gosh. I was licensed in 2007. Yes. Um, you know, as we sit with clients, so many of their stories go back to family and mm -hmm. those early relationships really shape how they explore dating relationships, how they explore mm -hmm. friendships, how they explore parenthood, how they explore, you know, partnerships and even being colleagues sometimes, you know, I think it touches on who we become in such a way that we have to be willing to dissect some of those relationships and pull those unhealthy pieces out. I can see women all the time who say, I don't get along with women because they don't get along with their moms. Or, you know, you see women who may say, you know, well, I don't, I don't know about relationships because they saw their, their parents' dysfunctional relationship. Or you see couples sometimes where they both have these unhealthy family relationships and it comes up in the couple stuff that they're just reenacting some of these things. So, so much about who we are and how we engage with others is really rooted in our families. Indeed. I want to ask you, though, for you, what inspired you to, A, become a therapist? Can we just start there? A little bit of your backstory of like, what, why, why did you want to do this? Yeah, that's so interesting. I don't feel like becoming a therapist was a conscious choice. I thought I wanted to do like macro level social work. I wanted to do like policy. I wanted to do um, like grant writing and all of these things. And so my first year in grad school, that's where my internship was focused. And I did that stuff and I was like, uh, not what I want to do. This is so boring. Um, 
for me. <laughs> totally. Right. And then the second year I said, well, maybe let me try some one-on-one stuff. And mm. my internship was at a runaway shelter for teenagers. And it was a lot of family therapy and individual therapy with those teenagers. And the first time I had a client, I was like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> this is why I always got in trouble for like talking. And this is why people open up to me. This is, yeah. I didn't know that this was an opportunity until I allowed myself to explore it. And it just felt like a natural click for me that this mm. is it. Don't do anything else. Stop working at Gap. Um, you don't need to write any policy. You need to be a therapist. It's it's so amazing how you can it can find you, yeah. even though you weren't necessarily looking for it. But there's no denying that feeling of like, oh yeah, this is right. This is what I should be doing. Which is so, I don't know. It's why we do it, right? It's why we keep doing it. For you, from being a therapist, being in the trenches with your clients, how did, I want to go back to, you know, Set Boundaries, Find Peace, A Guide to Reclaiming Yourself, your first New York Times bestselling book. How did that get chosen as the topic? Because I know my story of why I chose it, but I'm so curious to know from your, your experience, why were boundaries what you chose? Ah, I want to hear your story too, but my story is, I would say about midway through my career, when I started seeing more adults and not children, I noticed this theme around work-life balance. I treated couples. I work with people who were having issues in their family relationships. And a lot of what they talked about was what they thought in their heads, but they never said to other people. So it was mm -hmm. a lot of unexpressed needs like, oh, I really need to be off of work by five o'clock to pick my kids up. I wonder what would happen if you said that to your boss. You know, it's like, <laughs> right. it's like, idea. oh yeah, I have an idea. Why don't you try to say that? Or while I'm cooking and you know, the kids are running around is so frustrated. It's like, well, you're not single. Could you maybe ask your husband to grab the kids while you cook? You know, so these sort of things started coming up more and more. And I'm like, this is really like boundary issues. People don't know how to communicate assertively and their behavior turns passive aggressive in these relationships. You know, people will slow down at work. They'll start to not be as good as they used to be in relationships. You know, one of the things that I see go first is like sex, communication. Then they start to, you know, maybe have affairs and all these other things because someone isn't doing the dishes. So so yeah. being able to, to state your needs to other people, whether it's your mom, your boss, if you're the boss, being able to boss yourself well, all mm -hmm. of those things are really, really important. I don't think people see that as, oh my gosh, I have a issues with a issue with boundaries as much as it is all of these things in my life need to change without me saying that. And it's like, <laughs> no. You, you really can change the things in your life by being vocal, by setting some very clear expectations, by mm -hmm. asking other people to, to help you. One of the most common boundaries that I see that we don't necessarily think of as boundaries is people not accepting help. I see that so much with women. I see it so much with mothers Unfortunately, there is something about the strength of a woman that just wants to be able to do everything herself, Indeed. everything herself. You know, when, when I'm seeing new couples and they're married and the woman feels like she is the better parent and I'm like, you're not, <laughs> you're not the better parent. You're not better at changing a diaper. You know what you are more practiced. That's and the only difference. And controlling, You're also you've just controlling yeah. the crap out of it, right? Yeah, you've just been peed on more than your husband, <laughs> and now you know how to properly secure a diaper. That's how we all learn. <laughs> it's okay. not. Oh my gosh, I'm better at changing diapers. It's like you're not pamper. You're not huggies. You're not like an <laughs> expert. You know, everybody has to practice. Everybody has to practice cleaning. Everybody has to practice cooking. Everybody has to. So you have to allow people to maybe make some salty chicken if you don't always want to cook dinner. Just have a huge cup of water next to it and say, mm, 
maybe less salt next time. <laughs> you <know? laughs> but, uh, but you don't say, oh, gosh, I'll cook everything because every time they cook, you know, I, I think there are so many things that are boundary issues. And really, the boundary keeper is us. It is us being able to hold these expectations within ourselves because so often we put it on other people. Oh, mm -hmm. they have to remember all of these things. Well, I'm pretty busy. So me remembering <laughs> every single unique thing about you is a hard ask. Yeah. So if you want me to know something, remind me. And that's, yeah. it's the same thing with your partner, with your kids. There are certain things that they may not remember. They're not trying to be mean. They're being themselves. Right. So we have to make requests and that is so hard and difficult. And I wanted to get into this work because I, I see people struggling with it. My clients will come in and it's like, oh my gosh, I don't want to go over my mom's house. And I'm like, there's your boundary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, right. You just said it. I don't want to go. Wow. How, you know, like, how do we help you execute that? Right. It's so, it's funny. I was watching an interview that you did with Lovey that was so great. It was like a, on YouTube. And one of the things you said about not accepting help is in the grocery store. You're like, this is an easy way for you to start being able to accept help. When they say, do you need help? Just say yes. Just, just say yes. Yeah. Let the person bring your bags to your car. That's a service. They do it. And then you said something really funny. You were like, someone wants to know, do I need help sweeping? Yes. Sweep, grab the broom, do it. Even if I don't need necessarily need that help. But your point in that interview, even though I thought it was funny, was to start institutionalizing mm. the ability to say yes, when it comes to help, instead of saying no, which will eventually change this sort of ingrained thought that if I need help, I'm a burden. If I need help, I'm weak or something's wrong with me. And I loved the idea of that because it's it's so funny. I, I use a similar example where even the kid trying to pack your bags at the thing, you know, in the past or the, the taxi driver who's, I'm going to Europe with a huge ass bag. And he's like, I got the bag. I'm like, I got it. No, I got it. Just pop mm -hmm. the trunk, you know. Mm -hmm. what, why, why do I got it? I mean, that was when I, in my twenties, I do not got it now. And if someone says, I'll get your bag, I say, thank you. <laughs> but there was something so naturally ingrained in me not wanting to like bother the cab driver. Like I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what that shit's about, yeah. but this need to overfunction and overgive and overdo. And I think that the whole thing about what you said about people, not, we don't want to have to say what our boundaries are. We don't want to have to ask for what we need. We think everyone should just know. And that's certainly what you're saying your clients felt, what I saw with my clients as well. And I think hopefully both of what we've written is normalizing the fact that nobody has a, you know, a, a forecaster. Like they don't know mm -hmm. how you feel and what you want. And what my mother had said many years ago about what you were saying with the cooking, like if it's, if it's saucy or too dry or whatever the thing is, I remember complaining to her about, I was living with a guy who I said he could, didn't know how to vacuum and could never brown garlic properly. He always burned the garlic. <laughs> and she was like, Terry, let me tell you something. Your father never touched a vacuum in the entire existence of his life and never once stepped in the kitchen other than to get food that I made. So if you want it done your way, you will- You have to do it. Yeah. End up like me doing it all yourself. So maybe just be grateful that you're with someone who wants to do, you know, so it sort of shifted my mindset yeah. around it all having to be my way. Or like you said, I'm the expert garlic browner, but are you? And why? Like <laughs> Maybe it's supposed to be burnt. I mean, how do you even know how it's supposed to be, Terry? It's like, That's you don't right. even know it's supposed to be burnt. You're making it wrong, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so, Seriously. you know, I'm, I'm at the phase of life. I really could, I could take a butler. Like if somebody just wanted to stand next to me yes. and say, what next? Sunglasses, water, nuts. <laughs> like, yes. Go, I've go to Trader so, Joe's. <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh. Why don't they deliver? I could go on Please. and on about that. <laughs> but, you know, I, I think that we have to get better at having a little list. I remember when I had my first child and people were like, what do you need? I need somebody to sweep my stairs. 
Like seriously, you don't need to hold a baby, um, but I do need my stairs swept. I need a few meals in the freezer. I mm. need some nipple guards. So my yep. nipple not rubbing up against the shirt. I need, yep. you know, like, <laughs> I'm just, <laughs> can you water my yeah. plants? You know, yes. like these are things that need to be done. But the important thing for me to do is to hold the baby. Right. Yes. So I will hold the baby. I don't need you to come over here because everybody wants to come over and see the baby. Hey, no. the baby needs plants for oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Who's going to take care of these plants? Can you come help with that? So <laughs> please, we sometimes we just have to when I'm sick. What do I need? I need, you know, someone to go to CVS and grab my prescription or I need someone mm -hmm. to, you know, make sure I have some alkaline water or whatever it is you need yep. when you're sick. Yep. You have to be able to say, OK, because there are many times where we're re-experiencing the same things. And then our story becomes no one is ever there for me. Yep. And often yep. we won't let them be there. Yes, it's so true. But you you make such a good point, though, Nedra, of letting people know the things that we need and that will make us feel loved and supported, as opposed to someone coming over to hold the baby. Fine, grandparents, like initially. But if someone says, I really want to come help, and we're able to say, do you know what would be helpful? Mm -hmm. You know what would make me feel really loved and cared for? And that these are boundary things that we're talking about is asserting what we actually need and not feeling like our specific needs are burdens, right? If I have a preference, how is that a burden to someone else? But in a way we were trained to believe that we should just be grateful that they want to come and hold the baby. And you're like, but no, because that's not actually what I need. Yeah. But where does it come from that we feel like a burden? <laughs> Mm. childhood of course childhood <laughs> many of us are really taking that energy that we may have felt from an exhausted parent or from a frustrated mm. parent and we are saying i am still a burden even now with my friends with my partner with my parents as i am an adult i am a burden for asking for help with my laundry or a ride to the airport or these other things, because it could be true that at a, a particular time, someone may have been, oh, I don't feel like it. Oh, another mm -hmm. thing. But we can't take that energy into every relationship. Right. And we have to consciously recognize it and choose not to and understand, wow, this is a repetition of some kind maybe this it's not appropriate for this situation you know mm -hmm. early on i want to talk a little bit i want to talk a lot actually about drama free about the new book and about what you're sharing in the new book and i think it's so amazing early in the book you discuss the importance of unlearning dysfunction right so we all have modeled behavior we all have things that we may not be normal but it's mm -hmm. normal to us so mm -hmm. share a little bit with people watching this or listening so what does dysfunction look like and how can they recognize dysfunction in their own families? There are levels to dysfunction. Dysfunction could be your mother is critical about your marriage. It could also be that you have some sibling rivalry with one of your siblings. And, you know, larger scale for some of us, it could be struggling with a family member who has an addiction, struggling mm -hmm. with someone who has some mental health issues that they're not willing to treat, or maybe they're, they're treating them, but they're not getting better and things are getting right. worse. It could also be having, you know, to be the responsible person in the family and manage everything. So there are all sorts of ways in which we can be dysfunctional in a family. And that word is really challenging, right? Dysfunction is like, oh my gosh, that's such a heavy word. We think of these really mm -hmm. heavy things like sexual abuse, neglect, and physical abuse. When in actuality, most dysfunction is just a pattern that is a problem. 
It is something mm-hmm. that is not working for one or more people. It could be when you say something to your to your mother and she gets upset, she just hangs up on you. Is that mm-hmm. the same as physical abuse? No. But for you, that is a big problem. That is dysfunctional. Yep. Do we need to say, oh, that's not a problem. It's not, it's not physical abuse. No, it is a problem for you. Therefore, it is important. Mm. I think that point it's so easy and I've seen it for decades with my clients minimizing their Mm -hmm. own experiences because they're always like, I know other people had it worse. I'm like, hello, I'm not talking about other people. Or they say, listen, I know my parents did so much better than their parents did. I'm like, your 10 year old does not give a shit about that at all. The, the, the little you, right. The, The little person within you, your small self, doesn't care. And it is a problem. If it hurts your feelings that your mother hangs up on you, if you say something she doesn't like, that is a legitimate problem. And it also is dysfunctional because it's communication cut off. It's, it's, it's rude. It's painful. It's kind of mean. Mm-hmm. So I think that we all have to look at what are the things causing us pain in our family relationships, right? And you don't need to, it doesn't have to be quote unquote, like legitimized by anybody else. If it feels painful to you, then it's something that you need to handle. So what do people do, Nedra, in your professional opinion? We all come from dysfunctional families, pretty much. I mean, maybe there's a very, very small percentage of people who didn't, but I don't, I've never met them in 25 Mm. years of being a psychotherapist, literally never. So what, what do people do if they find themselves where they're, they get, they get drama free, start reading, they're like, wow, now I'm identifying all of this dysfunction within my family of origin or within my friendship group. Because it, obviously it doesn't just relate to our families of origin. What is the beginning? How do people start with not just unraveling it? Once, once they go, hey, this is a problem. Then what are the next steps that people can take to address it? We start having more conversations. Mm-hmm. We start changing our behaviors in those problematic relationships. If you have a parent who hangs up on you, how do you address that? Do you just call them back the next day and have a regular conversation? Most people will. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, that's just something she does. Well, there needs to be a conversation. I once heard a woman say that her mother would, would do that as a way to control what she was able to do. And so she would, you know, use... Well, I'll stop talking to you for two days or I'll stop talking to you for three days. And once she started to talk to her mother about that behavior, she stopped doing it because it wasn't working anymore. She was only doing it because it was effective. It would change the person's mind. And so once you notice, hey, I know what you're doing. You're trying to get me to agree with you. You're trying to get me to do this thing. And the way that you're doing it, it hurts me. Many people, you know, our parents love us, most of us. <laughs> um, you know, our families love us. They want the best for us. And if that's the case, sometimes these uncomfortable conversations can be really helpful and not harmful. I totally, you know, hear here to that because I always, you know, an observation of being a therapist for so long is that people can only act stuff out or talk stuff out. And it's like if you're acting it out, right? It was working with Mm -hmm. the mother controlling that person's behavior by hanging up on them. It stops working when you point it out, right? And when you go, hey, this is painful. This is happening. I don't, let's talk about it. Let's do something different. You now create another option. Mm -hmm. You're going to, sometimes people will be defensive. Sometimes people will be relieved, right? Sometimes they'll be like, oh, so that mother stopped doing that because Either maybe now there was satisfaction in having a conversation, but it's like you being the person who has pain points around what's happening in dysfunctional relationships by taking your advice and having conversations, you're creating an opportunity for a different behavioral dynamic. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because if you don't correct behavior or even let a person know that you have a problem, it will continue. It will continue. And that's why we report most problems. We wouldn't sit without, you know, we wouldn't sit with a cell phone that that doesn't ring. You know, we call our cell phone company. 
We say, oh my gosh, I have a phone here and it's not ringing. You know, there are things we would do in any other situation, but for some reason with families, it's like, oh, uh, that's the way it is. This person just hangs mm -hmm. up on people. And it's like, they don't have to hang up on people. And I find <laughs> that in families, there is this collective thought about a person's behavior. Like it'll be a problematic mm -hmm. person and everybody thinks like, oh my gosh, this person, they are whatever. And nobody tells them. <laughs> it's just like yep. it's, it's like you know what we'll just all pretend when they're around that they're not a problem and then as soon as they leave we will come together and talk about how much of a problem that person is <laughs> and that'll really get us going and then it'll yeah. happen again and it's like right. what if you collectively had separate conversations or had a community conversation around this behavior if this person knew that 25 people <laughs> had the same issue. I think I think they feel a little pressure to do something differently or they wouldn't have 25 people to be in relationships with in the same way because then you all will have some boundaries. Hey, if you do this thing, then that. Right. That then there's an actual consequence for this yes. behavior instead of us just feeling hurt or upset about it because here's the thing that you're talking about really Nedra is when we don't say anything, we're colluding with the bad behavior. We're like, cool, this works for me, even though it doesn't by not saying anything to mm. the person. And I think it takes courage, of course, to make those changes. But you talk quite a bit in the book about codependency and enmeshment. And these are some of my most favorite topics. So let's talk a little bit about that, shall we? Yes. Codependency is one really big challenge that you may have in one relationship or multiple relationships. And what I find is what I'm starting to see more of, and tell me if you're seeing this, Terry, as people are becoming adults, I'm finding that some parents have a codependent relationship with one of their children, but not all of them. And it really impacts the sibling dynamics, the parent-child dynamic, because there is this one person who maybe the parent feels like they need this extra support. They don't know how to do a job application without me. I'm like, ma'am, you're 60. They're 25. They know the internet right. better than you. <laughs> so like, mm -hmm. it's like, oh my gosh, I, I have to be so involved in everything. And then these other siblings are like, wait a minute, like we have needs too. Is it a need for you to complete a job application? No, but I'd love a phone call every day. Right. Is it a need for you to, you know, give me money for Uber or put money in my cash app? No, but I'd love for you to come over and have dinner with me. Mm -hmm. So as we're in codependent relationships, we are really stealing a lot of attention and energy from the healthier relationships that we can have. But how often do you see this in dysfunctional family systems? Oh, so often, you know, I, we have come to equate codependency with love. If you're not mm. overgiving, if you're not trying to save a person from their stuff, <laughs> if you're not trying to be highly involved in a dysfunctional person's life, you don't love them. And, mm -hmm. and I've seen people who are codependent try to make everybody else feel guilty because they don't want to be codependent. It's like, yeah. but this person needs this help. It's like, uh, I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> it's like, you know, I've, I've also seen with, with the codependency stuff where one person, if, if they were my client trying to get healthy and putting boundaries in place and having conversations and realizing they can't help the addict sister or they can't help the brother who's in jail, whatever, whatever the thing is. But then having one of the parents really be like, you have to, mm. like you you, this is what family does and you can't have that boundary and going up against the, the family, the cultural norms behaviorally within the family system where it's like, this is what we do. Mm -hmm. We are a family that, and that whole collective identity thing with codependency, I see in my, in my therapy clients where there's this fear, right. Of being kicked out of the pack kind of, if I don't do the thing, 
that my mother says I must do to be a good sister? Am I a good sister still? Can I be healthy and still be accepted in this family, you know, this dysfunctional family system? But so much of the time, of course, the clients are just feeling the pain of the fear of rejection as opposed to, I mean, they know it's dysfunctional, but, you know, you still feel the pressure. Yeah, I I think there is some pressure. And I will say that when people have more resources than the others in their family, there's a lot of pressure to give. Yes. That is, you know, that is what I'm seeing more of now. Well, you have X amount of dollars or this person, this person has this. So now they can give it to all these other people. And it's like, wait a minute. Do we understand that we don't, you know, it's a choice to care for people in a certain way. And you may not want to, you, and, and it's not necessarily selfish. Right. You know, do you have oh. to elevate someone's life because your life is elevated? Or do you invite them to your house? Do you right. invite them on vacation with you? And that's it. It doesn't mean that they right. need an equal home to your home. So there are times when, you know, in families that codependency, it is really pushed like you need to do these things for people or you need to be how I would be in situations that are similar. But it's interesting. And it's it's where this is where the choice comes in, though. I had a client who did very well. in in a young life, did very well on YouTube, like an early influencer years ago. Mm -hmm. And there was an expectation, the entire family is that she would buy houses for everyone that she, you know, like there was so much pressure. And then I'm like, okay, so you have to earn at what level for how long? Because those, none of those people have any income to afford to maintain the house that you just bought. You know, it was, it was a, a very sticky financial enmeshment that took a long time for us to detangle and, and really mm-hmm. get into a legal thing of how can you be protected? Cause then she started having a family of her own and it's like, you, you can't, your, your parents can't be your children when you actually now have children that you are legally responsible for. Mm-hmm. But I just saw the enmeshment and how painful it was for her because, you know, she was the golden child. She was the one who made it out and the pressure to bring all the people from the neighborhood with you and, you know, your family of origin and and lots of other people. The pressure is real is what I'm saying, you know? Yeah. I remember MC Hammer when he was, oh, I loved MC Hammer in the nineties. I'm going to play some after this interview. But MC Hammer, his performances, he would have like 60 people. It would be 60 people on stage, all of them doing the hammer. And you like, oh my gosh, look at Hammer. And a few <laughs> years later, he went broke. Yep. Because he thought I had to bring my family, my neighborhood, everybody. And it's so interesting that when they, you know, it's like the giving tree. Once they take everything they can, you know, there's nothing left to give. Mm -hmm. And then they can't give you anything because they didn't have anything to give. Yep. So really with Hammer, the IRS came for him. So one thing he didn't do when he was buying all those houses and all those houses for other people is he didn't pay his freaking taxes. Yeah. And he ended up being screwed. Yeah. That's really tough. You know, I I think that happens a lot, of course, with entertainers that there is this, you know, survivor's guilt and you feel Mm -hmm. like, oh my gosh, I have to take care of everyone. But I I think even when you're not a celebrity, you have more women becoming successful. You have people doing well in relation to their family of origin. And there is Mm -hmm. some survivor's guilt around how much you can do for people. One thing I've suggested for some of my clients is create a little family bank account. And maybe Mm -hmm. you put $100 or $50 or $1,000, whatever you want to in this account every month. And if cousin so-and-so wants to borrow some money, fine. But if the account is depleted, you don't have more to give. Now, if it rolls over to the next month, great. Somebody can get $2,000. But once it's at zero, it's a no. Right. Yeah, I love that idea because really you're talking about putting boundaries 
on the giving so that the person doesn't feel greedy, mean, terrible, that they're not doing something, but they also are not going to end up like MC Hammer, like, you know, yes. I mean? <laughs> and be yes. broke. In yes. the book, you talk about starting from scratch when it comes to sort of understanding the, you know, if your reference point is dysfunctional. So how do we change to healthier patterns? And you have just the thing you talk about starting from scratch. So how do you suggest people start from scratch. Mm. Doing an emotional audit, doing an energy audit and doing a relationship audit. What makes me feel a certain way? If we really tune into our feelings, we know with a sibling, with our parents, with extended mm -hmm. family, we know how we feel. If you have to go to the family gathering and the only way you can get through it is to get drunk, <laughs> I would wonder, is that drinking for fun or is that drinking for survival? Mm -hmm. If you're surviving the, the interactions with them, what might need to happen? Mm -hmm. Could it be a shortened visit? Could it be um, no visit at all? Could it be, you know, maybe not going for all holidays and choosing a few out of the year or one out of the year to go to? There are all sorts of ways to deal with that. And the way that you uncover what you feel and how you feel in your relationships is to really be present with your emotions. When I'm present with my emotions, I have noticed, wow, this person really makes me anxious. <laughs> They really make me anxious. And you know why? Every time I say something, they have to say something back. Every time I make a suggestion, they ugh, they don't want to do it. Every time I say no, they get, you know, they get really defend. Like all of these things, we know mm -hmm. how we feel, but we're taught to bypass it, to just get over it, just keep moving, just keep moving. Mm -hmm. And really what we need to do to be better in those relationships is to respond to it appropriately, not to ignore it to respond to it appropriately. I am feeling this. What are my options? Mm. So basically you're really suggesting don't go along to get along, mm -hmm. be present in your own emotional, your own internal life. Mm -hmm. So that instead of being like, Oh, this is how it always is. When I go home, maybe it is, is that good for you? It's really assessing, like you said, doing an audit, as to what the experience is. I would say to my clients who had very controlling families of origin that expected every holiday they're coming home and staying like in their high school bedroom. And I was like, how about you go, but you stay in a hotel or you stay in a bed and breakfast or whatever nearby. At first, they'd always be like, oh, my mother is going to be so pissed if I do that, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, here's the thing. You're not going to die because your mother is disapproving of what you're doing. And would you want to actually go home more if it was more like a vacation and you stayed in a hotel and you had, you, you were limiting the amount of time you were interacting with this dysfunctional family, because we both know, and you say this over and over in the book, we're not changing other people, right? When we mm -hmm. change, they have the opportunity to respond differently to us. But the only thing we can control, and I've had, I really have had a couple of clients who are very successful in staying in hotels, which in the beginning, when we talked about that, it was like, oh my God, I could never do that. I'm like, I don't know. How about we don't say never? <laughs> how about we consider that it's possible that you could do that mm -hmm. and how people get on board with the new normal if you stand strong in your boundaries to create the new normal? Yeah. It can be really tough to, to get people to think outside of what they think is possible because so many yes. people are like, oh, they're going to hate it. They're going to be disappointed. And it's like, that's a part of life. You'll disappoint people in relationships. People will disappoint you. It doesn't mean that you have to do everything that they want you to do. It might just be an opportunity for you to learn to sit with discomfort. And realizing that being uncomfortable isn't going to kill you. Mm -hmm. Like you're going to be okay. You talk in the book, um, and this will be the last thing that we cover, but I wanted to talk about it, about being a cycle breaker. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about some of the challenges that people who are intentionally 
breaking these this family dysfunction, these cycles of dysfunction that have been around forever, probably as long as the family has been around, when you are the first one doing anything, you're challenging the norms and it's difficult. So what are some of the challenges that cycle breakers might face? Mm, it's it's what you just mentioned, that pushback, that why do you want to stay at a hotel? You've always stayed here. Your room is good mm-hmm. enough. We cleaned your room up. That pushback will really um, take a cycle breaker down. I think that we have to learn to create community when that community isn't available in our family or origin. And that can look like, you know, deeper friendship connections, deeper relationships with our colleagues. So we are able to have that level of support and comfort is certainly establishing a therapeutic relationship. But one of the hard things is pushback. Sometimes people distancing themselves from you because the changes that you make might make them uncomfortable about the changes that they are not making yet. And so people may distance themselves from you. Um, I, I think another thing that happens with cycle breakers is not having community. Sometimes some cycle break, breakers try to operate in isolation. You know, I'll just be by myself. No one understands me. And that's not really a space to be in. That's why we need that community support, that collective care from our village. Another mm-hmm. thing that happens with cycle breakers is anger. You can get really angry at people for not wanting to be better. And I don't even want to say better. Let me not say better, different. Because your Mm -hmm. better may not be their better. I see this a lot with addiction where people are like, oh, they need to stop using. It's so terrible for them. They want to keep using though. Your terrible is not their terrible. Would I want to be in their situation? Absolutely not. But it's not enough for them to not want to be in that situation. Right. So the better that we are sometimes offering people is not their idea of better. Right. It's so true. And it's understanding that that's not necessarily our side of the street and that your side of the street is how you will interact with that person if they have an addiction issue, how much yes. time you will spend. Will you be with them when they are using? Will you bail them out? Will you give them money? Like those are all the boundary things that you can control, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that's, you know, I think that's another thing that we don't have enough information around that we feel like, you know, the only way to help an addict or to have a relationship with them is for them to stop. Mm -hmm. And that is not the, the thing that happens mostly, but it's, it's the thing that will create the most friction, trying to get them to be different. And really the only part that you can control, as you stated, is yourself and what you do in that relationship. Right. All right. I have one last question for you. So personally, and this is just because I remain obsessed with boundaries, what has been your most challenging boundary struggle and how did you overcome it if you have? Oh, my most challenging boundary struggle. I would say, you know, one of my challenging boundary struggles has been getting people to like my boundary. It's like, (laughs) why don't they just like this boundary? It would make everything so much easier. Uh, (laughs) I'm still processing it. And I think I always will because it's like, It's like, I thought this was a wonderful idea to tell you you couldn't bring your dog. That's a problem. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So yeah, sometimes I am still a bit bothered when people are like, I can't believe you would say that because for me, it's so rational, right? It's it's something I've thought about for a long time. It's something that I've ran past like eight people and they all agree with me. Maybe they're lying. (laughs) Um, (laughs) something I've talked about in therapy. And then, you know, it really rational boundaries don't even matter when you're saying Mm -hmm. it to a person who wants a different thing. Right. Like it doesn't even matter. Like if you say to someone, Hey, you can't bring your dog because your dog isn't trained. I don't want the dog peeing all over the floor. Sounds like that makes sense. Like, Hey, this person doesn't want, you know, accidents all in their house. But to the person receiving that, they're like, I can't Mm -hmm. believe you would say that to me. Reject my dog, reject me. 
Yeah, reject my dog, reject me. We are done with this relationship. It's like, oh my gosh, what did I do? Um, so yeah, just dealing with the response that some people mm -hmm. have when you place a boundary. I just want people to be like, yeah, I get it. I understand it. And that doesn't always happen. Oh, I feel you. All right. Tell us what you're lit up about and where people can find you. Obviously your book is out and about so people can get that everywhere. Fine books are sold, but tell me where people can find you. Uh, you can go to my website. All updates and information that you may need is there. Um, what am I lit up about? I am lit up about so many things. The main thing I'm lit up about is rest. Um, I did a book tour about a month ago. I did not have a book tour for Set Boundaries, Find Peace. So this was my first book tour. Um, I am a mother of two. I am married. I have practice and I do all of this, you know, Instagram stuff. So I have been really leaning into rest and doing nothing and binging TV shows and mm -hmm. lighting my favorite candles and having dates with my friends and hanging out with my family and, you know, just getting lost in online searching of nothing, you know, just like, mm -hmm. just decompressing. And it's been really good. That's what I'm lit up about. I think we can go, 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 go. And we also have to rest, 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 rest. So right now, mm. um, I love Rihanna's work, 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 but <laughs> I love that we see her right now, resting, resting, resting. So <laughs> correct. cooking, cooking another human, taking care of her baby. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, yeah. uh, no more work hard, play harder, work and rest. <laughs> Indeed. I love it so much. Well, thank you so much for spending so much time with us today. I super appreciate you and all of the good work that you are doing in the world. Thank so you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.